Hello and welcome to my view from the piano bench. We do this every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. here in my Joel Holtz Notes YouTube channel, along with Piano for My Friends, every Thursday evening at 7. Thank you to all of you who support and encourage me through the links available on the support page of my website. You'll see a link to that page in the video description. And while you're in my website, if you haven't been there before, particularly poke around and see what's going on. And if you look over the options there, there's different takes on the drop in the tip jar, which is always appreciated. Uh, the, the Patreon is also essentially a tip jar drop that structured and uh, as a thank you, you will receive exclusive content from me. So thanks so much and off we go. Topic today, narrowing down the objective. And this is going to be a window into piano practicing strategies. However, the larger intent is to suggest to you that this could apply everywhere and not just specifically to the piano. So I'm not looking at this as a music lesson, although musicians hopefully will get something out of it, but whoever you are, hopefully you'll get something out of this. Uh, so when you are doing something, let's say playing a piece of music, you know, in, in order to learn that piece of music, You have to practice that piece of music. But then, what is the objective, ultimately? Is the objective to learn that particular piece of music strictly, or is the objective to, to become the musician you want to be in order to play that effectively in order to deliver that. And then if that's the objective, when is the objective met? And I would say it's open-ended. See, for me, this is about growth, continual growth. Growth doesn't stop. And if growth were to stop, if it didn't matter anymore, I don't think I would have any motivation to be playing because there's all these discoveries to be made, right? And uh, this wonderful artistic landscape to get a more and more comprehensive view of and learn to play in those fields and, and so forth. Uh, and so if we're simply playing a piece of music and that's the objective, what does it mean to play the piece of music? Are we talking like data entry and a keyboard? Right? Or are we talking about expression? And, and, and I think you get my point because any uh, component of that expression is connected to every other component of the expression. And the way I can illustrate this, I think, is by talking about practicing scales. So we know what scales are, right? We know, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And there's all different kind of scales. And there's you know, minor scales and different kinds of minor scales and major scales and, and other kinds of scales, modes and Dorian and Mixolydian and blah, 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 right? Uh, so what's the objective to learn scales? Why are we learning scales? You kind of see, see where I'm going. So whenever you want to learn or approach something, the way to really dig deep is to narrow down a specific objective in that. 
And the reason I'm going to use scales is I'm going to talk about different specific objectives in practicing scales or practicing whatever. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Okay. So, when you give somebody a scale for the first time, there's actually two things that you're approaching primarily, and I'll do them one at a time. The first is, and this is the big monster to slay when you start to play piano you've never played before, and that is two-hand coordination. Because our hands aren't wired, our body's not wired to do things differently on one side or the other. We're, we're set up for symmetry. I mean, we look symmetrical, right? We are symmetrical. So, uh, actually, maybe I should have introduced fingering first. We're going to have to combine these a little bit. So, actually, no, we don't have to. Right? Uh, so, the first thing that you learn playing the piano and by the way, if you don't play piano at all, maybe you'll pick up some things here. But again, the objective is to create the broader template that whatever you're looking at, in order to go deeper in it, get more specific. Find that little piece that you're going to really focus on. And when you put it in the context, that little piece you're focusing on of a larger thing, it connects to everything else and everything gets better. It's like putting a handle on the suitcase, you know, and then when you lift up the handle, it's whatever you practice, you're actually lifting up the entire suitcase, if that makes sense. So the first thing that you do uh, at the piano is you organize five fingers for five notes. This is like, well, how do you know where you are? How do you know what you're doing playing the piano? You organize five fingers for five notes. Uh, let's see here. It sounds like that, you know, vocal exercise that I'm not going to demonstrate because it would be painful for you. <laughs> but you can imagine it, right? And then the left hand can do it. Now, if you try to put both hands together, this is doable, but actually it's a little bit of a struggle. And the reason it's a bit of a struggle is because when the right hand is playing the thumb, the left hand is playing what we call a five finger, one, two, three, four, five. And when the right hand is playing two, the left hand is playing four. Three happens to go down in both, but then when the left hand is playing two, the right hand is playing four, and so on. You will find as a complete beginner, it's actually easier to put both thumbs on the middle C, the note to the left of two black keys. There's no resistance to doing this because your hands are doing now the same thing. So the objective for a complete beginner starting to practice scales before that is a five finger exercise. Is to begin to develop two hand independence. And I use the word coordination. I could use either word. And then when you uh, work on the fingering part of it, where you have to bring your thumb under a finger, because if you're playing Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, which has eight notes, you have five fingers then you're going to have to do a little math. You're going to have to do three plus five equals eight, right? So, so you take one, what we call five finger position, play three notes, bring the thumb under. And if I want to talk about practicing specific things, even within that, bringing that thumb under. That's something you can work on for a long time. 
getting used to that. So it sounds like I'm playing with eight fingers, eight equal fingers. So there's another practice objective. I'm just going kind of off script, but to make a point. Even articulation, no matter what finger is playing, no matter how it's approaching, so it sounds like the same thing. And I said articulation, and that opens up uh, another angle. So right away, I think I've identified five or six practice objectives. But what I'm going to get back to is that when you're doing this, you're focusing on one to master the one. So the first thing we're talking about is two-hand coordination or two-hand independence. So that becomes a goal. And when you're, when you're practicing, you're practicing for the goal of the facility of two-hand independence. You're not practicing so much to learn a scale or to learn a piece of music if that's how you're approaching it. You're learning that skill set. So if you're like improving your golf game, you know, and you're just going to get up there and you're going to go to the golf course for two hours a day and you're going to swing your little heart out for two hours at a time, you're probably not going to get very far until you start narrowing down the, the, the components. And I have no, know nothing about golf. But so why did I say golf game? I don't know. But whatever subject you know about, whether it's golf or something else, insert, you know, specific objectives that you can easily identify here, right? And that's the point. Okay, so terrain independence and the little demonstration of, 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 of that would be me walking left hand bass, because that's what people will say. It's like, how do you keep both of them straight? How do you do them both at the same time? Well, you know, you internalize them, you learn them, you you allow them to play themselves, you know them deeply, etc., etc., etc. Let me see, what tune should I play? I don't want to play that tune. What other tune should I play? <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, am I going to play I Got Rhythm All Right? again because uh, as I'm playing I'm realizing what I'm specifically doing is trying to restrain myself from playing other chords or playing other things so that you're what you're seeing strictly is me playing individual notes one at a time with each hand and going completely different directions and and I will say that is a very defined specific and considerable skill set uh, at, at that level uh, and, and, and my joke is, that's the unintended consequence of that lobotomy when I had as, that I had as a kid. See, something good came out of it. But not. Yeah. So I'm going to play, play it again. And I'm going to allow other things to incorporate in because I'm just going to play it the way I play it. But what I want you to observe, you know, just look at different ways that I, I was going to say facilitate whatever, express two-hand independence and coordination, right? And then take it back to your practicing. You're practicing this. Oh, because I forgot to mention. When you bring your thumb under, it's so much easier to go down in the left hand, up in the right hand, because your the fingerings you use are the same. The notes you play are different, but the fingerings are the same. You bring your thumb under at the same time. Right? If you've never played piano before, 
uh, and you have a piano, and even if you're not looking to learn piano, you could do this rather easily. Three fingers, five lower. However, when you play the same direction in each hand, which means you have to reverse the process in your left hand and play all five fingers and then three over. Right? Oh my goodness. First time you try it, you try to bring your thumb under and you tell your left hand not to bring your thumb under and your left hand wants to like hit you in the head. Because it's like when one hand brings the thumb under, the other hand wants to bring the thumb under. And sometimes that's what happens, exactly what I did. It's like one sabotages the other. And so you have to train yourself that your left hand doesn't care that my right hand did this. And now my right hand doesn't care that my left hand is doing this. And then when you do practice scales, and I know I just went out of the frame. Right? And you just take that and you just layer it on and on and on. Uh, so you might get a sense of just simply practicing scales like that just to develop a two-hand independence is an important part of the facility to do something like this.
So probably when you watch somebody play piano or, or, or me and you see something like that, you know, you don't think about two-hand independence. And that's something that you practice toward. Uh, now, that's kind of an attainable thing where eventually you're not really practicing toward it because you have cut that cord, you know, and you have lobotomized your brain, sort of. But that's one objective in practicing scales. So, uh, another objective related to that, which I've sort of touched on, is practicing fingering. So, as you would imagine, there are specific fingering strategies and rules uh, to organizing yourself while playing the piano. And I could launch into a big long thing here uh, the, the, about that. And the nature of the piano, that it demands that you be able to have control over how you hit the note because the entirety of how the note sounds is related to how you strike the key. You know, there's no buttons to push, there's, there's no volume thing, there's no, you know, diapason or flute stop. It's just how you hit the key. What you do there determines the sound of the piano. So you have to really, 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 really have control, right? And the uh, first thing about the control is organizing your fingerings. Like, you don't want to get somebody to run out of fingers, right? Uh, I could launch about, you could actually get away with that in the old days with like the uh, the pipe organ, more than you can get away with it, the piano. Uh, which I won't go into. All right. And so we have these little, you know, fingering strategies. Yeah. And the first one I, I said is the three plus five equals eight, which for some reason I like to introduce C scale fingering that way rather than say one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. It's just like two hand positions. But the thing I'm going to point out here that you might not think of, particularly if you, if you don't play piano, is uh, one important part of what we call scale technique. Now, not chords, like when you hit a big clump of notes, you can't really control what finger plays where because you just have to spread them out and, and play the notes. But when you're playing, one note at a time, something linear, a line of music, something a singer would sing or a violinist would... <laughs> I was going to say, a singer would sing or a violinist would violate. <laughs> Play. Try to put that on Facebook. If a singer is singing, does that mean a violinist is violating? Shut up, Joe. There's an advantage and a disadvantage to me recording these things in the morning as opposed to the evening. Because I think clearer in the morning and maybe I'm scarier in the morning too. So the one rule I'm going to bring up with scales is that your thumb, which you don't really think about as shorter than your fingers, it isn't a whole lot shorter, it's not the same as this, but it's jointed so much further down that, you know, it is. It's a short, it's a short stubby guy. And so you can't mm, reliably take the whole hand, jam it up here so your thumb can play a black key. So because you have at least two white keys, for every scale you play, because a scale has seven notes and there's five black keys. You know, there's always a place to put your thumb when you're playing a scale. Or a line or a melodic thing. So at no time that I have to jam my hand up here, at no time did my thumb not play a white key. Now if I'm, like I say, playing big chords, my thumb probably will have to play a black key. But then that's a different thing because your hand's just like a, a block right there. It's just 
So pick stick, pick a stick. Right? Uh, so what you're doing then when you're practicing scales is now you're reinforcing fingering patterns. And that's another thing that you do when you practice scales. So you focus on the fingering. figuring the 3 plus 5 equals 8 because in this key E flat I can't start with my thumb it's a black key so I have to have a whole different kind of range and I actually like how this sounds or it's easier I should say for me to feel like I'm going evenly across them and here you don't hear it but I feel it a certain little clunkiness you know clunk 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 that's something else that you're practicing, even articulation. Uh, so I'm sure I'm making my point already, but I'm going to just keep going with different examples of this. So since I specifically talked about the, uh, the thumb and the black keys, I'm going to play a tune in the key of E flat, and I'm going to try to more, you know, single lines in the right hand while I'm accompanying myself with the left, and then just watch and make see that my thumb always is comfortably here, and I'm never, like, hurting myself, and I'm never straining, I'm never trying, nor am I thinking about it, because I practice that, I reinforce that. My hand knows what to do. Make sense? Just 
frustrated something and I'll just stop and tell you. So, I don't know when I last talked about this on, on, on the stream, but did you see how I tried to talk while I was playing? And then I kind of shut down. But you may have seen me before demonstrate how I can talk while I'm playing, right? Uh, and actually the fact that I shut down and couldn't talk while I was playing was validation. It was, it was an affirmation. Uh, that I was doing the right thing, which was I was thinking about what I was playing, right? So if I have to put the thought, you know, concentrated, focused thought, to what I'm doing, then I'm using up that part of my brain that can talk to you while I'm playing. And since I usually don't do that, <laughs> you know, I, I usually like am, am playing from my intuition, playing, you know, without a gender or, or, or motive or objective, right? Uh, I'm used to just being able to open my mouth if I'm just doing whatever, then I can talk to you while I'm playing. It doesn't matter. But I don't even know what I want to talk about. But it doesn't matter either. It doesn't stop me from just running my mouth. Because I'm not trying to do anything specific. I'm just letting it flow. myself thinking about it slightly but you got the idea that was reasonably fluid ish uh, and so practicing and this is a, a, a way to make a point too practicing is not performance at all performance is when you know you go into that creative expressive place no matter where you are as a you know beginner or, 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 or whatever but you're still going to that ex expressive place. And practicing is where you are applying concepts and objectives and goals and structures and stuff. You don't do that when you're performing, unless you don't want to perform well, <laughs> right? So hopefully that all makes my point, which probably tells me I need apple juice. I don't know why, I guess I do. So let's talk about other things that you can use scales to practice. Uh, one thing would be what we call articulation. Articulation would be how you, how you articulate, how you strike the E. And you can hear different approaches to articulating, louder, softer, disconnected, very connected. It is the uh, natural expression to express sounds and have them touch each other, have them be connected. And preferably both hands working together, which I didn't do here. Connected as opposed to... Which is Typically something that you do, like if you're agitated, hey you, come over, right? As opposed to, hello there, right? And so you, you know, you might not think that that's an important part of the arsenal of playing the piano, to have the ability that you do verbally to, you know, pretty much attack the sound different ways in order to be emphatic or in order to be smooth and whatever word I want, right? Or to be, you know, sound agitated or sound, right? So, some version of what we call staccato or the or the no 
notes being disconnected as opposed to the notes being connected like they are in speech or like a violin or you know something like that and about the disconnected notes is then you want to be precise in practice like disconnecting them all the same like having like the sound be you know half on half off half on half off half on half off this being that oh that was terrible so is that was sort of it, you know, half on half off, or like a quarter on three quarters off. Hot potato, which a lot of people think staccato is, you know, hot potato, hot stove, when actually, technically, it's half on half off. Subtle difference, right? Not played well, but you still have subtle difference, but. You know, the, the idea of expression is mastering the subtlety. Uh, or the idea of like an effective golf game is having those little nuanced things so that, you know, you can, you can adjust your shot ever so slightly. You can do that little trick thing, you know, whatever, you're shooting pool. You know, for, for, I, you know, when you watch things on Facebook or YouTube, you know, the first time you watch something, eventually the algorithm will suggest it again and then if you go down the road of this next suggestion, then it just like snowballs on itself. So like before my trip that I took to Germany, at some point along the way, I watched one of those or a piece of one of those airline crash investigation videos. And then I got a suggestion for one and then I watched it. And then like every night I'm watching an airline crash investigation video before I go to bed if, a few weeks before the trip. And I'm saying to myself, I need to stop this. <laughs> Which, which which I did. Uh, or I guess at some point along the way, I uh, watched some trick pull shot video, and now they keep coming up, you know? But the trick pull shot thing is really cool, and there's all this just specific techniques that you impose to get the ball to do this, and, and that's kind of the thing here, and that's what we're, that's what we're practicing. Uh, so, you probably don't think much about articulation, but I'll play a, a stupid little, did I say stupid? I'll play a cute little song. <laughs> a little staccato, and that's how you expect to hear it. You, you don't expect to hear this. You might expect to hear the piano in better tune. We'll fix that. No, you want this. Actually, you know what's funny when and this is a combination of deliberate and uh, maybe not uh, when my right hand was playing more staccato my left hand just disconnected more too I'm gonna say that's not a one hand following the other in a coordination sense that was I think instinctively more like evening out the articulation so the like staccato not connected feel is consistent throughout. But anyway, all this stuff to notice and think about, isn't it fun?
something you want to practice it. you watch like the rock and roll piano players or people who aren't really you know practice or skilled and everything's just a, it's a board it's like your hands your hands are two by four right no 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 ouch pain right so actually you could turn chopsticks Exercise. Exercise in wrist, wrist fluidity. In fact, you could like practice all sorts of things through chopsticks. You could practice playing on octaves. You could practice legato. Staccato. You can make an exercise out of out of anything. Uh, anecdotally here, uh, when I came up as a young piano student, with a uh, 78-year-old when I started, when I was seven, German piano teacher, Mr. Schmidt, who drove to my house in a little red Mustang, and uh, he would ply me with the Turney studies and the Hannon books and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> But when I was in college and studied with Billy Kaplinsky, which uh, was, was like super cool, uh, her approach was that between scales and passages and pieces that you, you know, create your exercises from in order to work out what you want to do, there's your technique. They're, 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 that's what you practice. You know, you don't practice mindless things. So I've kind of adopted that. And you can make a technical exercise out of anything. But you practice to that specific objective. All right. Now, let's do another one. And I'm going to get my other phone because I have a metronome app in each of my phones. And this is actually a big one. And, and that is time and rhythm. And, and, and we'll spend time, like any of these specific little items I might, or have been before in other versions of this series, uh, spent entire hours talking about. So let's just turn this up. And let's do, let's, let's set it 60. 60 beats per minute. So these are seconds. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, right? Now, of course, I'm applying all the other things, the fingering and the articulation, and I'm thinking of other things that I didn't talk about. The specific, you know, strategies for pushing the key down or getting the, having the key depressed and all that. But all, but now, what am I focused on? I'm not thinking about those other things. I'm focused on matching the tick. Now, there's another reason to practice scales. And if you uh, ever took piano lessons with me, or ever do, uh, especially at the beginner level, you're going to be focused on internalizing this and of course when you're practicing the scale you're reinforcing all those other concepts but 
you're only thinking about this. And it's interesting that when you're only thinking about one thing, the other things take care of themselves. Because you don't have to think about them. Right? In that same way, anyway. Which, eventually, you don't have to think about any of it. And that's when it gets magical, right? So I'm matching the tech because I need to know where to anticipate that. So the idea of practicing time is very easily accomplished through scales. Now watch what I'm going to do next. technical, I play eighth notes to the quarter note take of the metronome, or quarter notes to the half note take of the metronome, which if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, right? Or watch this now. faster but the point is not speed really here the, the point is practicing with feeling the time so what did I do uh, so let's let's count okay let's go back let's play one two three four we're gonna count in four one two three four skip some steps here and just say I'm gonna count twice as fast one two three four one two three four one two three four so yes, I don't have enough time to go too deep here if I sped if I doubled the speed from 60 to 120 two three four I'd be counting this fast right so what I'm doing is I'm doubling my counting now one, two, doubling my counting that helps me organize playing the notes faster one two three four very up and down one two three four one two three four right. you might know where I'm going uh, in jazz in particular right we move the emphasis or the focus from the downbeat from the, uh, the downbeat to the upbeat to the backbeat where rather than one and three we're gonna we're gonna put one and three in between and we're gonna count two three four one two three four through some steps there, jump through some hoops to get to the point of like having the metronome on two and four rather than one and three, which is a more advanced thing. But that's a reason to practice scales, metronome on two and four. And this takes a lot for some people to get to, to get to. And then like you learn how to just feel two and four. Let me see. Actually, practicing 
mixing scales to be able to get to a play a tune like this. And again, I'm thinking about what I'm trying to do while I'm trying to talk to you, and that's screw me up. So let me stop thinking. start doing things like this and kind of swinging when you play. You know, it feels good. It doesn't feel like Mozart. foot to it feels good uh, that's a skill you practice too now you can take this metronome one two and four thing and you know pull it away from the scale uh, and just play tunes with the metronome on, on two and four and that, that's a, a great way to practice and then of course you can uh, what tune did I play before did I play I, I got rhythm I think maybe I don't remember but if I played I got rhythm now uh, let's Approximate the tempo. 147, that's random. And this is faster than I do. You don't have the metronome and you're always playing by yourself how are you going to like learn how to do that root thing <laughs> sets in order to do all this other other cool stuff and I can't tell you how to do it in your own discipline but apply this if you don't already apply this to whatever you're working on uh, and uh, I keep going back to golf game but I don't play golf uh, bowling was my thing until it wasn't uh, so one other general thing just about practicing now uh, it's always so important is you want to get in a frame of mind where you're listening to what you're playing yeah because you're listening to it in the right way but let's just talk about just listening just just focusing on like getting out of your process and taking in the sound that's coming at you that, that you're producing and that's that's a practice skill too you know and you're you're internalizing so you're practicing scales to begin internalizing the sounds okay some of you will know the answer to this because i ask this question repeatedly sometimes i'm going to play two scales 
same thing or two different things when I play one and two. Here's one. Here's two. Now I'm messing with the articulation. Alright. Same thing or two different things? The answer is yes. I'm playing two different things. They might think about what the notes are called. If I had to read it in sheet music, I'd have to read these are the different notes. But in terms of what I'm listening to, if you get the, the pitch placement, you know, higher or lower frequency, whatever, out of your head, you are hearing So one particular specific skill set that you can do with your practicing scales or anything else is just focus on the sounds you're hearing and internalize them apart from what the labels are, apart from what they're called. And that's how you learn to eventually work with the music and flow with it and improvise and allow it to happen because you are working with now the sounds, the relationships. You're not thinking about, I just played a C flat. What the heck's a C flat? It's a B. Why is it called a B? I mean, a C flat when you could call it a B. That's another rabbit hole. But anyhow, you get the point. <laughs> I tripped and fell down. Here's my soul. did in that little phrase I played something underneath and then I played the melody louder yeah I mean here's something to practice practice a scale like it is our 45th way to practice scale and play one hand louder than the other Then you get that two hand coordination thing again. And if one hand plays loud, the other hand wants to play loud. Or if one hand plays soft, the other hand wants to play soft. So, again, the same thing, different ways. So, uh, if all you do is just practice scales and practice scales, and you play them, and that's nice, you put them away. You could do it for years and really not accomplish so much. 
And when you're focused on what the objective is, is when you're going to get from point A to point B, and that's what practicing is. So narrowing down the objective, focus on practicing. So anyway, that's my view from the piano bench today, this morning, tonight, whatever it is. And hope you find it interesting, and thanks for being here. See you tomorrow night, maybe. See you at one of the live gigs, or see you on a live stream, or... Yeah, or, yeah, thanks, bye. Okay.